you. Great to see some familiar faces here. Um, I am uh, Will Inboden, uh, late of the University of Texas at Austin, and as of three days ago, newly employed by the University of Florida. So, um, can you also, okay, so um, sad to leave Texas, happy to be in, Cal in, in Florida. So, and of course, happy to be here now in California. So, um, anyway, I also have the honor of chairing this panel. Uh, which uh, is going to be a deep dive on a couple of uh, very different, but I think you'll find complementary uh, aspects of the uh, the Iran Contra scandal. Um, and uh, to to uh, to talk more about that, we're going to be hearing first from Nicole Hemmer with Vanderbilt University, uh, presenting an early draft of an early chapter of what we think will be a big new book project, which sounds pretty exciting, focusing on the singular and uh, very perplexing figure of Oliver North. But as you'll hear in her remarks, she'll use that as a uh, 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 Colonel North as an interpretive figure for some broader themes about changes in uh, politics and governance in the 1980s and. 90s. Uh, and then we will hear from Joseph Ledford uh, very recently of Johns Hopkins SICE uh, and officially with Hoover now? Is that? Three weeks and three weeks. Okay, three <laughs> weeks away. All right, I just gave it away. Three weeks away from joining the, uh, the Hoover Institution. So he, like me, is also in the midst of a transcontinental move. Um, uh, so we'll hear first from Nicole and then from Joseph. Uh, and then I'll offer a few reflections myself and then we'll turn it over to all of you. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. Well, I really, really appreciate Will's um, many caveats as I start off this presentation. Um, my last book just came out last uh, last fall, and now I'm diving into this new project, and I'm excited to be presenting on it. But as you uh, will tell, it is still in its kind of speculative form. Um, but I do think that Oliver North and Iran Contra, and the way that North emerges from that scandal, affair, incident as a kind of political celebrity on the right has a lot to say about not just developments within right-wing politics in the 1980s and 1990s, but actually in the broader political culture of the United States um, in ways that I'm going to gesture to today. For many Americans, Iran-Contra was a low point in the Reagan administration. For many people in the Reagan administration, Iran-Contra was a low point, um, an act of lawlessness, lies, and cover-ups that showed a government out of control. Yet 10 years after the scandal broke, Oliver North jo joined about 500 supporters at a $150 a plate dinner celebrating his role in Iran-Contra. The tribute to North featured a slew of endorsements from nearly every major movement figure on the right in the mid-1990s, including a short biographical film that sure did make it look like North might be considering higher office. When North finally rose to speak at the event, he made light of his role in Iran-Contra. Looking up and down the head table at some of the biggest names on the right, he joked, so many unindicted co-conspirators and so little time to thank them all. North's crimes, and they were many, had become a punchline and a path to political celebrity. From the moment that he testified to his crimes before Congress, North grew a base of support on the right. By 1992, he had become a popular figure on the campaign trail. By 1994, he was a campaigner in his own right, running for Senate in Virginia. From there, he became a radio talk show host, uh, joining the airwaves uh, with Watergate conspirator G. Gordon Liddy. The right's embrace of North raises fascinating questions about developments in the conservative movement in the closing years of the 20th century. North became a celebrity on the right not be, despite his illegal actions, but because of them. So what does it mean that in an era in which the right was embracing law and order politics, they were also embracing somebody who had turned lawbreaking into a virtue? How did scandal become a viable pathway to both celebrity and to political power? And why doesn't Iran-Contra, a scandal that led to a wave of indictments and convictions undone by pardons and appeals, factor more into our understanding of how presidential scandals play out? I could bring you a thousand op-eds about Watergate written in the past five years, and I could give you maybe about five on Iran-Contra, um, even though Iran-Contra is a much better model, uh, at least so far, um, for the kinds of scandals and lawlessness that we saw in the previous administration. So these are some of the questions that I'm exploring in this new book project on Oliver North. 
Um, because it's in its infancy, or possibly in its really annoying toddler years, my talk today is going to focus on some of the big picture ideas that I am playing with as I begin to piece the project together, and then I would really love to talk about more in the Q&A. So one of these themes is Oliver North's relationship to the law and to lawlessness, how he understood the power of law, how much he understood himself as beholden to it, that North broke the law during Iran-Contra is beyond dispute. He violated an arms embargo against Iran, the Bolin Amendments, barring aid to the Contras, and then destroyed and falsified records in order to impede the investigation. But North and his supporters were less concerned with the particular laws that he violated and more concerned with the goals he was pursuing. There were, they believed, some things that were higher than the law. Now, this is not a belief that North developed in the Reagan administration. And I think that there's an incident from earlier in his career that is worth integrating into our understanding of North, but also into kind of the understanding of the rights relationship to law, law and order and lawlessness. For North, his ideas about the limits of the law came into play when he was in Vietnam. In 1970, after North had been in Vietnam for a while, he had led a platoon, um, he was on leave when a former member of his platoon was arrested and drawn up on charges of war crimes um, for leading four other um, members of the military uh, in what was known as the San Thang Massacre, um, in which these five soldiers uh, executed 16 women and young children. Already by the time that North arrived back to defend the person who had been a member of his platoon, Randy Harrod, Two of the people who were involved in the massacre had already been found guilty, one on 15 counts of murder and one on 12 counts of murder. For North, he felt that it was necessary to come and intervene because for a couple of different reasons, but most importantly, because Randy Harrod had saved his life uh, in a firefight several months earlier. He came back to Vietnam, he arranged lawyers, he served as a character witness, and he would later say, you know, even if Herod acted wrongly, which I doubted, I still wanted to help him. So even if he was guilty of these crimes, even if he had led this platoon into this pretty horrific massacre, I wanted to save him from those consequences because I owed him something. I had a loyalty that I had to honor. And help North did. Again, though two of the men had already been found guilty on multiple counts of murder, Herod was ultimately acquitted. And Herod's trial revealed something about North's, North's sense of fairness, legality, and values. Loyalty to his team was one of his highest values, even over justice or a full accounting of events. I also think it matters that this is Vietnam and how North felt about the politics surrounding Vietnam, his belief that was broadly shared on the right that politicians, particularly those in Congress, had stopped the military from being able to successfully prosecute the war. Um, so why are we focusing on what soldiers are forced to do in um, really sometimes difficult situations instead of the authority that they needed from Congress, the support that they needed from journalists and the American people in order to fight the war successfully. And that idea um, that politics was messing up American foreign policy, in addition to being broadly held by the right, it was true for many on the right in their assessment of the Cold War as a whole. If government wasn't going to do the job, somebody needed to step up and do the work. Uh, you actually see this in a lot of different ways in foreign policy in the 1970s and 80s. There are a number of conservative activists who are kind of freelancing foreign policy, um, not in a big dramatic way, but going and supporting anti-communist uh, rebels and militias in different places across the world. Uh, you have people like Dana Rohrabacher, who would go on to become a member of Congress, uh, spending several months with the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Grover Norquist goes to Mozambique and Angola uh, to hang out with the, uh, the rebels there. You also see that kind of freelancing in somebody like Ross Perot, not necessarily a doctrinaire conservative, but somebody who did, who was organizing like airdrop to Vietnam, did a successful hostage rescue in Iran in the late 1970s. So there was this idea that there was a space where people could do foreign policy um, as private individuals. The question that Iran-Contra would raise is, can you do it freelance foreign policy as a member of the executive branch? And while that is 
obviously a, a bigger, different problem with a different set of issues, the logic appeared to be the same. If politicians had created unnecessary obstacles to victory in the Cold War, was it not the right, even the duty, of Americans to act, regardless of what the law itself said? That was the presumption, and in fact, the defense of many of those involved in Iran-Contra, um, as well as their supporters. It relied on the logic that there was a law above the law, and that is what you needed to ultimately be loyal to. So that's one aspect that I'm diving into in this project. Another is looking at the political coalition that was kind of dead set on turning North into a political celebrity from the moment he appeared on the national scene. From the start, North was seen as politically valuable, particularly by a group called the New Right. Now, at this conference, you've probably already heard quite a lot about the New Right, a group of conservative activists seeking to harness the energies of grassroots movements, social policy, and the religious right, and harness it to this new populist right politics. Um, really important, pretty anti-Reagan uh, for a lot of the 1980s. And they latch onto North almost immediately um, and help to make him an important figure of the emergence of the post-Reagan right, um, which I write about in my, in my previous book. There are lots of groups involved, uh, including a front organization for the Church of Sun Young Moon. <laughs> really interesting, not going to talk about it unless you have it in Q&A, but uh, I want to focus on folks uh, within the New Right, like Howard Phillips at the Conservative Caucus. Um, he was helping to spearhead a pardon petition organized by a front group called the National Coalition to Pardon Oliver North. The Conservative Caucus regularly sent out these direct mail letters, um, which they found very profitable. North was an issue that you could raise money off of in the 1980s. Um, they made hundreds of thousands of dollars. Jerry Falwell, head of the Moral Majority, was also on this beat. He made North a cause celeb within the religious right. Um, for the religious right, North appeared not as a sinner who had to be redeemed or an imperfect vessel for salvation, but as a persecuted Christian who had followed God, God's law rather than man's law. Falwell is going to offer both religious and political interpretations of North's prosecution, uh, persecution, however he saw it. He portrayed North as a Christ figure, telling students at Liberty University that they should find North's plight familiar. After all, we serve a savior who was indicted and convicted and crucified. But he also saw partisan politics behind North's prosecution. In a 1988 fundraising letter, he wrote, in my judgment, petty partisan politics have made Ollie North, his family, and the lives of the Nicaraguan freedom fighters pawns in a liberal campaign to humiliate President Reagan. Um, and he runs this pardon drive out of Liberty University. This all takes on new urgency uh, during the criminal trial for Oliver North. That is because it provides a new logic for the North pardon. If North is found guilty, he would not only lose the right to vote, depending on what state he lived in, he lived in Virginia, but he could also potentially lose the ability to run for office. Uh, felony convictions can't bar you from running federal office, something I'm sure we're all very familiar with at this moment, um, but it, you can be banned at the state level. And in fact, Virginia had this ban on people who had felony convictions uh, for running for office. So if, if North wanted to run, say, for Senate, uh, he wouldn't be able to do so with a felony conviction conviction on his record. And Phillips underscores this danger in a direct mail letter. He writes, America needs courageous leaders. Ollie North is one of our best, but he will only be able to leave if he, lead if he is granted a full and total pardon. Now, ultimately, this is not necessary. Um, North's conviction is overturned on appeal. Um, he immediately then starts planning for some sort of political future. One of the things he does is he takes over <laughs> that kind of direct mail operation for Ollie North. Uh, so he has his defense fund. He has his PAC. He has the Freedom Alliance. And within just a couple of years, raises $20 million in direct mail funds, making him by far the most successful um, individual direct mail um, institution in the country, and he is going to prove that again when he runs for Senate in 1994 and raises $17.3 million despite not having the support of the Republican Party. He becomes the biggest statewide race fundraiser in U.S. history to that point um, because he has such a broad body of support. Um, I think that I am getting very near the end of my time. So I just want to point to one other factor that I'm really interested in looking at. Uh, might be the, the least fleshed out, but it speaks to this broader political culture. In 1987, when Ollie North was testifying before Congress, America was awash in political scandals. 
televangelists were being taken down with embezzlement scandals, um, sexual assault scandals. Gary Hart, front runner for the Democratic nomination, uh, was forced out of the race for an extramarital affair. A few years later, while North was on trial, Representative Barney Frank was battling a scandal over his relationship with a sex worker. A few years later, Bill Clinton arrives. You know that story. Um, and these are not all simply about sex or candidates' private lives. Um, it didn't end all of these people's careers, but it is part of a shift of what got covered as scandal and how it was covered. Um, Matt Bai wrote a book um, about this shift happening in 1987, this idea of the tabloidization um, of American political scandal. And then you even see attempts to try to wedge Iran-Contra into that, um, some, some focus on um, North's assistant, Fawn Hall. She gets lumped in um, with Donna Hart, uh, Jessica Hahn, who is the victim of... Uh, uh, of Jim Baker, um, all of them are used to make 1987 the year of the bimbo, uh, according to the American media. And uh, Oliver North and his uh, uh, his presentation as a clean cut Marine and born again Christian actually helps him avoid that kind of tabloidization of the Iran Contra scandal. So there's something that's happening in what gets reported. Um, right, this is a, a moment in cracking open the kind of reporting on people's uh, politicians' private lives, um, and what captures attention as a particular kind of scandal and what's scandalous. Um, there is a lot more to say about um, North's role in media. He does star turns on uh, uh, shows like Wings and Jag. Um, he has a little bit of a sideline as an actor. Um, there are movies made about him. Uh, his Senate run leads the documentary A Perfect Candidate. Um, so he is somebody who lives in this space of actor, celebrity, and activist, three platforms that are available to him because of his role in Iran-Contra. It's that Oliver North, a TV star, the Senate candidate, the radio host, the cash cow, who is greeting that packed ballroom for the tribute to his work and to his lawbreaking. By then, his charisma was easy. The jokes about shredding and co-conspirators and subpoenas, they don't leave a mark uh, 10 years later because not only had they cost him so little, but they had also given him so much. Well, I'm here to defend Oliver North. <laughs> Thank you to Will for chairing our panel, fresh off a plane from Florida. And thank you to my brilliant co-panelists for participating. And thank you to the Reagan Institute for organizing this extravaganza. I think the Reagan Institute has provided uh, the standard for all presidential foundations and how to advance scholarship for their namesake. This afternoon, my presentation draws on my forthcoming book, which offers a new comprehensive account of the Iran-Contra affair from its origins and the politics of the 1970s through its resolution in the mid-90s. Since you're in attendance, I presume you're all aware that Iran-Contra was a scandal that nearly destroyed Reagan's presidency. Despite Reagan's noble intentions of eradicating communists and saving uh, communism and saving American hostages, it is his greatest mistake. It's also a very bewildering episode. And despite its historical significance, the literature is focused primarily on the political theatrics and some of the personalities, rather than Iran Contra's transformative effect on American politics and political institutions. Malcolm Burns' book, which is the preeminent account, contains some minor exceptions. For my part, the most crucial aspect of Iran Contra was neither in Central America nor even Iran, but in the institutional revolution that the crisis set in motion in the United States. In my research, I've examined over the years hundreds of thousands of documents from government archives, private collections, as well as reviewed oral history collections and many periodicals. I've also prompted a new wave of declassification from the George Bush Library and the uh, National Archives, specifically the Independent Council Collection. So what do all these sources reveal? In part, I've concluded the following. Iran-Contra became the defining clash over presidential power in the realm of foreign affairs in the aftermath of the Vietnam War and Watergate. It ended the vigorous reassertion of congressional power that the war and Watergate inspired, propelling a surprising and rapid reanimation of the so-called imperial presidency. Reagan restored not only his presidency, but the president's role as the arbiter of foreign policy, a consequence of the bipartisan consensus on a powerful presidency serving as a foundation of national security. In the 1970s, the tragedies of Watergate in Vietnam may have inspired legislative reforms on arms transfers, covert action, and independent prosecutors, but they would not survive the Reagan era. Today, I submit to you 
that the scandal was an ironic constitutional crisis with a counterintuitive outcome. And by that, I mean at first, Congress responded to Reagan's Central American embroilments by seeking to restrain him from aiding the Contras. Yet, when that secret Contra enterprise intersected with arms for hostages deals with Iran, Congress abstained from impeaching Reagan and imposing its resurgent mandate in foreign policy, lest doing so imperil national security, domestic political order, and what they thought the presidency itself. Instead, Congress opted to address a policy and process problem with a fact-finding investigation of public hearings, which reaffirmed the president's paramount role in foreign policy, despite the optics of holding Reagan to account for alleged abuses of presidential power. As Congress sought resolution at the ballot box, the scandal persisted in a new form through Bush's presidency, as the independent counsel investigated for nearly seven years, alongside two new congressional probes into the alleged precursor of Iran-Contra, the October Surprise Conspiracy Theory, which claims that Reagan colluded with Iran in 1980 to win the presidential election. Sound familiar? <laughs> this corrosive kind of politics eventually exhausted Congress, leading to a tacit bipartisan agreement to dispense with the scandal after Bush pardoned the remaining offenders and Bill Clinton won the presidential election. Still, its pungent legacy lingers in American politics. In the remainder of this presentation, I'll give you a sense of my central takeaway by discussing how Congress addressed Iran-Contra and why congressional leaders concluded that impeachment would prove too damaging, especially at a critical juncture in the Cold War and with the legacy of Watergate casting a hulking shadow. In the q and I'll be happy to discuss any other aspect, of which there are many, and I'm sure you're very interested to talk about. The government's response to Iran-Contra in many respects was an exercise in crisis management for the national security state. In November 1986, after discovering North had diverted funds to the Contras, Reagan briefed a bipartisan delegation of congressional leaders at the White House. This included the incoming Senate Majority Leader Robert Byrd, the Senate Majority Leader Bob Dole, Sam Nunn, and the incoming Speaker of the House Jim Wright. After their shock quickly subsided, their conversation immediately focused on the implications for national security and how to rectify the situation. For quickly, Congressional leaders would face a conundrum. On the one hand, Iran-Contra demanded a congressional investigation. On the other hand, they wanted to minimize the damage to the presidency itself. They would express publicly what they said privately. Sam Nunn told reporters, we must all of us help the president restore his credibility in foreign affairs. We can't have a crippled president for two years. Byrd would say, we all want to see a strong president. We don't want to see a fatally damaged president. As such, Democrats would control Congress, but they would collaborate with Republicans. Wright met with Byrd, Dole, and House Minority Leader Bob Michael to form a joint select committee to avert what they referred to as a circus atmosphere. The Senate and the House formed the Joint Select Committee on iran contra in the first week of January 1987. They set quick deadlines for August for the hearings and November for the report. They would proceed with haste. This formation contained elements of bipartisanship, especially with the Senate, and, of course, partisanship, especially with the House. Byrd worked closely with Dole to form the Senate committee. Hawaiian Senator Daniel Inouye, informed by his Watergate committee service, sought to chair the committee with a focus on legitimacy. Crucially, he named Warren Rudman, New Hampshire Republican, vice chair of the committee, and emerged as staff. In the House, though, Wright assembled a mixture of liberal and moderate Democrats while Bob Michael appointed bona fide conservative supporters of the president, you know, to ensure a fair hearing. In contrast to senatorial ambitions, chair of the House Committee Lee Hamilton would not name Dick Cheney vice chair, nor would he merge the staff. Some divisions were too deep. Reagan's impeachment, of course, loomed large over these proceedings. To impeach Reagan, however, Congress had a high standard of establishing he knew and approved of the diversion. In evaluating their options, Congress became unwilling to impeach Reagan over a foreign policy scandal based on the evidence. To committee members, this was not a Watergate scenario. Watergate had involved abuses of power for personal and domestic political gain. Reagan's fiasco emerged from excessive covert operations undertaken in what he had deemed the national interest. Accordingly, congressional leaders questioned if impeachment served the country's interests. Delaware Senator Joe Biden captured the mood in his December 3, 1986 remarks to the National League of Cities Convention. He said, I think this is a time for all of us, Republicans and Democrats, to aid in an effort to save the presidency. America cannot tolerate another failed presidency. And there you have it from noted Reaganite, President Biden. <laughs> but one Democrat was okay with impeachment. Henry Gonzalez introduced a, an impeachment resolution on the House floor in March of 1987, although it went absolutely nowhere. I think there were about six people on the floor uh, that day, and business had concluded. 
But what impeachment meant for national security and the domestic agenda especially troubled Congress? Reflecting on this in 2003, former Speaker Jim Wright said, our overriding concern in congressional leadership, frankly, was less in embarrassing the administration and sending people to jail than in getting at the truth, maintaining the nation's equilibrium, emphasizing the rule of law, and avoiding a bloody constitutional confrontation. And Reagan himself had neutralized the political will of congressional leaders to impeach him by pursuing some accountability, namely the Tower Commission, some transparency, cooperating with investigations, and offering a unique apology to the country, which we haven't seen really before or since. With two years remaining, Reagan also became the indispensable man for the Cold War exercised a profound influence. At Tufts University in 1988, Daniel Inouye explained that committee members believed prolonged hearings would weaken Reagan and compromise national security. In a way, reasoned that the Soviets would exploit the domestic upheaval. In early January 1987, in fact, he had instructed Arthur Lyman, the lead counsel for the Senate, that they had to move with deliberate speed in the country's interest. Lyman himself would express those exact sentiments to Lawrence Walsh during their first meetings. Committee members felt a duty to bring about a timely resolution to aid arms control policy. In 1988, Lyman admitted that Unless you had a smoking gun, irrefutable evidence would cause the president to resign. To have gone down that road could have sacrificed whatever opportunity there was to establish a new order with the Soviet Union. Congress would, I contend, through their aversion to impeachment, empower Reagan to mitigate the existential risk of the Cold War, as Reagan did successfully achieve the INF Treaty shortly after the conclusion of the inquiry. Now, quickly turning to the hearings that convened from May to August 1987. To determine if Reagan approved of the diversion, Congress granted limited immunity to 21 witnesses, essentially thwarting any future criminal prosecutions, which were vacated on appeal that the ACLU supported. The committee were more concerned with public disclosure than alleged crimes. On this matter, former National Security Advisor John Poindexter's testimony in July 1987 was the apex of the hearings. The committee, however, knew how it was going to end, anticlimactically, before they ever aired a hearing. Three days before the hearings in May 1987, committee lawyers discovered Poindexter did not brief Reagan. On May 2nd, Poindexter participated in a closed deposition, and when he was pressed on Reagan's knowledge, he absolved the president. Publicly, in front of the committee, he acknowledged that he made a very deliberate decision to withhold the information. Eight months of intrigue ended with calm denials that were already known and achieved with immunity. Afterward, the committee released the report November 18, 1987, it received little fanfare upon its release, but its substance maintains an underappreciated legacy. The majority aimed for their findings to impose electoral costs, and they wrote the report for posterity. Indeed, the historiography, by and large, just recapitulates its findings. Endorsed by the Democratic members and three Republican senators, the majority found the Reagan administration culpable of grave misdeeds. They criticized Reagan for circumventing Congress, privatizing foreign policy, and engaging in tactics to undermine oversight. They found that Reagan bore the ultimate responsibility as president. Despite their criticism, however, Iran-Contra was not a time for curbing presidential power like the 1970s. Instead, the majority recommended minor changes to existing laws that allowed the president to retain prerogative in foreign policy. On covert action, they recommended that the president notify Congress within 48 hours, except in those rare, certain instances, using vague wording to provide for presidential decision and dispatch. As for the recommendations, Presidential findings would be written and signed before undertaking covert action, except when the press of time prevents it, and it would include language about the agencies and the participants. A wise Reagan, however, preemptively incorporated those recommendations on covert action into National Security Decision Directive 286, which he signed in October 1987, a month before the report's release. Reagan revamped those guidelines. The findings would be written. Retroactive findings would be prohibited. All agencies and participants would be uh, specified there would be periodic interagency reviews and timely notification of Congress within 48 hours, except in those cases of exceptional circumstances. The president would have the discretion to launch sensitive operations without immediate notification. Now, quickly, opposed to these conclusions, House Republicans, joined by two Republican senators, James McClure and Orange Hat Orrin Hatch, produced a minority report that made the case for the presidential prerogative in foreign affairs and defended Reagan. They argued that mistakes in judgment, nothing more, characterized the Reagan administration's actions. Yet, they criticized Reagan for withholding notification about the Iranian initiative and failing to inspire majority support for the Contras. 
Reagan had exercised poor political judgment by neither vetoing the Bolin amendments nor rigorously defending himself. On this, the minority castigated Congress for hamstringing Reagan with those vaguely worded amendments, which did not specifically cover the NSC. The minority based their arguments on the presidential's constitutional endowed power to conduct foreign affairs. As a theoretical basis, they invoked Federalist Number 70, in which Hamilton rightly argues that the energy of the executive is a bulwark of national security. And yes, I realize the irony that we're in the Jefferson room. <laughs> In summoning Hamilton, Republicans sought to resurrect the foundation of American security. They asserted that, as established by the history and the court, the president was the sole organ of U.S. foreign policy and could therefore ask governments to support the Contras and negotiate secretly with Iran. Reagan's policies have been constitutional, even if they were unwise. This report proved formative for its architects. Dick Cheney believed it was crucial to defending the presidency itself against congressional attempts to encroach on its power. As a vice president, he invoked it multiple times when asked about his views of executive power. Paradoxically, then, the congressional investigation into Reagan's foreign policy scandal stemming from alleged abuses of presidential power created the intellectual impetus for an energized post-Cold War presidency. Notwithstanding Reagan's codification of the majority's reforms, the minority contribution has thus proved the lasting consequence. Congress accepted their interpretation of presidential power by virtue of its actions, as a strong presidency is the tenet of post-Cold War U.S. foreign policy. After all, congressional leaders avowed to support this type of presidency during Iran-Contra. As discussed, congressional leaders believed that Iran-Contra threatened domestic political order and national security. In response, Congress inflicted the least amount of political damage and deference to the presidency because they would not permit another Watergate over a foreign policy scandal. In the end, indeed, politics stopped at the water's edge. The congressional investigation thus fu functioned as a fact-finding enterprise aimed at educating the public, not a catalyst for major legislative reforms. The hearings achieved counterintuitive results then, in which the public received a shocking account of Reagan's foreign policy in exchange for the reaffirmation of presidential power to execute foreign policy. What Americans knew, however, didn't prevent Bush from succeeding Reagan. Thank you. All right, I'll offer uh, just a few brief uh, reflections and suggestions on both of these excellent papers, and then, of course, we'll turn it over to uh, the interrogators here in the room. So uh, please use lawful methods, of course, in whatever your interrogations are. Okay, I couldn't resist. Okay. Um, so uh, it was a great joy to read both of these papers in full and in tandem with each other because judging from the titles, you might think that they are addressing very different aspects of Iran-Contra. And, and, it, and it remains to this day one of the most fascinating and truly bizarre scandals in presidential history. But what I hope you picked up from the remarks, and I certainly did from the papers, is there is quite a bit of overlapping concern uh, and interest on, the, uh, on this bigger question of the paradox of what seems to be a nadir in executive authority uh, then turns out to be a, uh, a, re a reaffirmation or reinvestment Invigoration or even strengthening of executive authority. And just as a methodological uh, matter, I think it's very interesting how Nicole uh, deftly uses this totemic cultural figure of Oliver North to probe those executive authority questions. And then Joseph uses his deep excavation of uh, thousands of hours of congressional hearings and testimony. Uh, he read it so you don't have to, right? So, <laughs> any stuff that, so um, any, but, but it just, I, I think it's a nice illustration of the historian's craft, right? How we can use different uh, uh, lenses or, or uh, points of uh, uh, departure to explore some common thematic questions. So, um, Nicole, very mindful of the caveats that this is early in the process of thing. What I offer here aren't really any criticisms, but maybe just some suggestions of stuff you may want to probe further, uh, uh, that, which I, I think you've got a, um, a really interesting project here, especially how, um, and I'll talk to the audience, but I'm going to send it to you, okay? Right, so, um, uh, uh, how you treat North as both a political and a policy and a cultural figure. And he has all of those. And, and that's why I like how you sketch out some of the different uh, themes you're going to be exploring. Uh, so, uh, so first, on North as a, uh, as a policy figure or this um, uh, uh, one setting a new precedent for executive authority, I would encourage you to explore that more deeply. North's consequences 
for succeeding democratic administrations in executive authority and national security matters, right? So think about, uh, especially because North represents this empowered but then rogue and National Security Council staff and presidential assertions of authority for, you know, different coercive methods. So look at uh, Clinton and the Balkans interventions, right? You know, uh, you know, he's not violating congressional laws there, but he certainly doesn't have congressional authorization for those. Or Obama and the Libya intervention, uh, or Obama's drone campaigns or Obama and ISIS, uh, none, you know, Clinton and Obama would certainly not want to say we are heirs of Oliver North here. And yet, uh, I think there are some some interesting precedents and content continuities. Um, of course, you also see this with uh, with George W. Bush, especially the figure of, of, of Vice President Cheney, who Joseph mentions in his paper. Um, Second, uh, thinking about North as a political and cultural figure, I like how you try to situate him in the context of the scandals of the 1980s and then kind of, you know, the rise of more non-traditional candidates, if you will. Um, I think there's a uh, there's even a deeper historical context you might consider exploring for him going uh, on this theme of uh, military leaders who get uh, 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 you know, fall athwart of uh, of laws or or presidential authority, and are making especially assertive uh, uh, demands on the use of force, who then later become political figures. Right? There's a lot there. Okay. General MacArthur, right? You know, Truman fires him, he comes back, he almost challenges Truman for the presidency, becomes this totemic figure for, for conservatives. Curtis LeMay, uh, George Wallace's running mate in 1968, right? You know, Gen General LeMay. And then bring it forward, Mike Flynn, right? I mean, so I think, uh, now you're thinking about this stuff already, but I think there's a, a kind of a broader, you know, 75 year uh, tradition there, if you will, that, that North is, North is a, a, a part of. Um, and then also we'll consider you uh, encourage, uh, keep probing more and more in Vietnam. Um, there is so much there. Um, have you read uh, Tim Berg's book, The Nightingale Song, yet? Okay, a must read. Um, a great profile of uh, five Annapolis classmates Bud McFarland, John Poindexter, Ollie North, Jim Webb, John McCain, from Annapolis to Vietnam on up through Iran Contra. Um, and so it'll give you a lot of grist for the mill there. Um, uh, uh, okay, then uh, the, the final theme is. Uh, because I, you, you, you mentioned in your in your paper. I know this is something you want to go uh, further on, and this overlaps with Joseph's concerns as well. Is thinking about the weaknesses and failures of the Watergate reforms, uh, uh, FOIA, FISA, so on and so forth. I do think you've got to look at the mirror image of that of. Uh, congressional failures in the 18, in, in 1980s and 90s. It's sort of like if, if 1970s is the high water mark of Congress reasserting its authority, one con once Congress has its authority, they don't use it so responsibly or effectively in, in the 80s and 90s. And there's almost and, and this is you know Joseph touches touches on on this too, but uh, but what I saw that uh, your initial line of inquiry seemed to be um, looking at some of the. Uh, the failures in those, the statutes themselves, the implementation of some of those, but I think you've got to look at uh, get some congressional failures too. And then I'll just put a question to you, and don't answer this yet because i got to put the same one to Joseph, but anything in Joseph's paper that causes you to change your mind to rethink what you're looking at? Okay, Joseph, over to you. Um, and Joseph was a, a do doctoral fellow with the Clement Center for uh, uh, for a couple of years, so we had a lot of time to talk about these things. I'll try not to revisit too many of our water cooler happy hour conversations. Um, uh, but and I know some of what I'm going to mention here, you don't do as much in the paper for this conference, but I know you touch on in your book. So, um, uh, but I think the the um, the audience might be interested in your reflections first. Um, explore public opinion more. Right? Because Congress is not just operating in a political vacuum when they're deciding about wanting to preserve the presidency while scores on political points. They're also taking their cues from public opinion, which is, you know, kind of like this in Iran-Contra, right? You know, Reagan hits the low point in his approval ratings, but then starts to come back. And, of course, that's why North is so effective. And this picks up on um, Nicole's themes, too. And in his testimony, he just kind of flays Congress, right? Um, and and you see that in uh, in, in public opinion, too. And that, that in turn, and so I, that almost needs to be another variable, I think, in the broader story that you're uh, that you're that you're that you're telling here, uh, as well as White House efforts to, to shape public public opinion. You made a passing mention to the Tower Commission report, and again, I know that's not the main concern of the paper here, which rightly goes into the uh, Joint um, Select uh, Congressional Committee. Um, but I'm just struck, and here I'll speak a little bit as an erstwhile practitioner. The Tower Commission report stands the test of time a lot better than the, the, uh, the Joint Committee report. Um, like, you know, a lot of NSC staff these days still read the Tower Commission report. You had two future national security advisors serve on the Tower Commission, Scowcroft as a commissioner and, of course, Steve Hadley as the uh, 
the gen general counsel. Um, and the Tower Commission's effort to preserve presidential authority while reforming the NSC and not making it operational um, is uh, a very important legacy. So again, uh, something I, I know you touch on in the book, but we'll, uh, we'd like to hear your, your thoughts on. Um, um, uh, and then, you know, maybe for the concluding chapter in your book, uh, you bring the, the story forward a little bit. Uh, what do things like the 9-11 Commission and the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act, which the Bush administration is, you know, quite ambivalent about, which creates the DNI, what do those say about, yes, there is this reassertion of executive authority as a legacy of Iran-Contra, but Congress doesn't completely go away either. Um, so uh, I think there might be some interesting continuities there. And finally, I'll put the same question to you. Uh, anything in uh, in uh, Dr. Hemmer's paper that changes your thinking on, on, on Iran-Contra? So, all right. I'll sit down now, maybe a couple minutes from each of you on, on any of those, and let's turn it over to the audience. So. Well, first I'll just say that it is, um, thank you for those enormously helpful comments. Um, this has been such a great experience to talk to somebody who is on the other end of a project on Iran-Contra. And so I don't have a ton of fixed points yet, since I'm so early in the stage of the project, but a couple of things um, that Joe's paper is helping me think through. There is this real frustration or tension between what's happening in Congress and what's happening with the independent counsel um, and the sort of criminal side of the investigation. And this idea that you have to choose between exposure and accountability, right? You can either have political accountability through exposure that might lead to impeachment or lost elections or some other sort of public accountability, or you can have criminal accountability. And actually what happens with Oliver North is he is, of course, convicted on several felony counts. But the reason that they're overturned is because he had given this immunized testimony and ultimately the appeals court backed by the ACLU was like, we, you can't separate out what a jury, the information a jury has. Um, could immunized testimony have interfered or made its way into um, this case? Like, you just can't, you don't get your, you don't get your, criminal consequences because you went after the public consequences. And so the fact that Congress pretty much understood that that was the issue, that they weren't going to get necessarily the uh, the political consequences, but they went forward with it anyway, is uh, a little annoying and also pretty interesting uh, to think through. And perhaps they thought that the political consequences would be the 1988 election. Um, the other thing that I you have me thinking about is... I, I am very interested in sort of the, like, Watergate to Iran-Contra, like, what's shifting between there, because you have such accountability when it comes to Watergate, and you have so little, ultimately, when it comes to Iran-Contra, so trying to pe puzzle together what happened. And one of the things um, that I was thinking about as you were talking was just how different it is to be facing another crisis so quickly on the heels of that first one that there was a real fragility to the system. I mean, what does it mean to impeach a second president within a decade um, or within 15 years? I, I think that that's um, a kind of crisis of institutions um, that is often talked about in the, in the papers of the time as a kind of scandal fatigue, right? Oh, we don't want to do this again, even though everybody's kind of watching the hearings, um, even though this is a big set of of crimes, um, maybe worse because they weren't for personal gain, but were in fact um, sort of taking over the foreign policy of the country. Um, but political legitimacy just looked very, very different, mm -hmm. and the country's stability and fragility looked very, very different um, because Watergate had just happened. I will take them in reverse order. Uh, from the Nicole's paper, I. I need to rethink how much emphasis I put on Oliver North because when I wrote this as a dissertation, I did not want to focus on Oliver North. I, I didn't really think he was that important to what to the historical significance of Iran Contra because I was approaching it from the historical development of American institutions uh, and Iran Contra's profound effect on American government. But subsequent declassification and investigation into the Independent Council investigation itself has shown. That there was a real concerted effort from Arthur Lyman and John Niels to get Lawrence Walsh to prosecute Oliver North before he gave immunized testimony. And I have declassified from um, the records between Congress and the Independent Council, if you're interested, it's at the National Archives, you want to go look at it, 
Um, Arthur Lyman and John Nields put together a devil's advocate brief for Lawrence Walsh to say the pros and cons of if you do not prosecute him immediately for destroying evidence, an obstruction charge for destroying government documents, which we will allow you to do before we give him immunity on everything else, you are not going to be able to prosecute him in the future because we're going to do this. And Walsh decides not to do it. He wants to pursue conspiracy charges. And Walsh, for better or worse, got sideways with Arthur Lyman anyway. Lyman thought he was totally insane because Walsh suggested that John Poindexter could have been a Soviet plant. Um, and so there were a lot of problems there. But the Congress was at least willing at the very beginning to say he destroyed government documents. This is a clear crime. There's no statutory interpretation about the Arms Export Control Act. Prosecute him for it. And Walsh neglected not to do it. So in, in the book manuscript, as I revise this section, I think Oliver North is going to have uh, more of an appearance in my book because it would be odd to publish a book about the Iran-Contra affair that doesn't say a lot about Oliver North, although it does say a lot about John Poindexter. Um, so that is certainly something that I'm rethinking. In terms of pulling the story forward post 9-11, I'm still working on that. I, I don't have enough to say on congressional attempts to reassert itself. It's certainly there. Uh, and I want to look at the 9-11 Commission. I want to look at the Senate report on enhanced interrogation and, um, you know, at those sorts of efforts, uh, including all the way up to the present moment about repealing uh, authorization use of military force and, and so forth. Now, the Tower Commission, which is near and dear to my heart, um, the Tower Commission, I would argue, is an exercise in applied history for reforming government. Because they were working in a short, short time frame, they couldn't read the secondary literature, so they perform an exhaustive oral history and look at the documents that were available. They interviewed past presidents, secretaries of state, national security advisors, and so forth. And a lot of that material is open. The case studies are open, some of the interviews are open, uh, and I would encourage you, if you're at the Reagan Library, to look up uh, the interviews with Henry Kissinger and Big New Brzezinski, because they have very different views. Uh, about uh, the National Security Council. For instance, Brzezinski uh, implores them to say that the National Security Advisors should be confirmed by the Senate. Obviously, Henry Kissinger does not. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and so out of this, they write the report. Steve Hadley writes it under the strict direction of Brent Scowcroft. I think Hadley did 30 drafts. I mean, it was, they were very concerned about this because this was going to be uh, a historical document that would preside over the policy process. And, and it did, and, I, and, and it, as Will said, it remains the blueprint, the manual. Um, Scowcroft later said, I think in a Miller Center interview that was opened after his death, that he did not have to institute that many reforms when he became National Security Advisor. Advisor that lauded Scowcroft model actually comes out of Iran-Contra because Frank Carlucci and then Colin Powell implemented all of the directives that came out of uh, the Tower Commission. So in a way, and with another irony, Iran-Contra revamped the national security making decision processes um, within the White House. It, became out, it came out stronger, better, and I think it helped Reagan achieve many of his foreign policy successes in the last two years of his administration, certainly with changing personnel, but also having the process in place. Uh, in terms of public opinion, it's not in this paper, but it's certainly in the book, and I think it's important. Because when I approach the question of why did Reagan survive Iran-Contra, it, it's actually kind of simple. Most Americans thought he was lying, but most Americans liked him personally. And public opinion polling and the very, very detailed internal polling that's now declassified and available in the Reagan Library shows this day by day. That 75 percent of the people they're polling are like, yeah, well, he's probably not telling the truth. We don't really like arms for hostages, but we really like Ronald Reagan. And he was at 68 percent when the scandal broke. And it dropped 21 percent in a month. Uh, and so his approval ratings, even in the midst of Ron Contra, were still higher than the current president. And it was a different time. It was a different time. So I think the historical context is incredibly important about wh why Reagan survived this. And when I made the, you know, he was the indispensable man and Nixon was not, a lot of it had to do with foreign policy, but it also had to do with congressional leaders actually liked Ronald Reagan. And if you look at these detailed notes that are available in those first contentious debriefings, where first they're outraged. They're like, whoa, what is going on? How, why, Oliver North, what, what is this? It's, it immediately is then focused on, okay, we have to restore process and oversight. You know, they're concerned. There is that bipartisan consensus available in that moment, not only for Reagan the man, but the institution. And certainly Watergate um, had a profound influence on that. Uh, eventually, Reagan recovered. 
and you can see it in the polling and the public opinion after the apology. Now, the apology is a totally different story we don't have time for, and Reagan was the most stubborn man to um, be in the office, maybe ever, uh, and it took a lot of convincing uh, to get him to apologize, even though he took incremental steps uh, to address the scandal. But then when he did, he gives a live address and says he's sorry, and you know they were using the Kennedy model, but they thought the Kennedy model wasn't forceful enough. It was buried in a speech, and Landon Parvin wrote the speech, and there was an infamous meeting at the White House with John Tower where... Some accounts he was crying, he was drunk, but they were you know, pleading with Reagan to, to, to make an apology. And after that, you see uh, a trend in Reagan's popularity increase, and certainly after the INF Treaty, uh, and then leaving office around 63%. And with that, uh, I look forward to your question. All right, uh, Daniel will do your... Assuming, assuming these are uh, accurate characterizations of your position, why are you, Nicole, troubled by the uh, resolution lack thereof to your honor? Joseph, why are you? I would say that uh, as we're thinking about how to hold people in politics accountable um, and what measures we have for accountability, that you had this pretty major set of, of law breaking. Um, you had these pretty major laws being broken. Um, and a cover-up that was just classic. I mean, shredding papers in the office. It was a pretty classic cover-up as well. And that there ultimately wasn't accountability for law-breaking that went at least to the vice presidency, if not to the Oval Office itself. Um, it strikes me that when leaders who are beholden to obey certain laws so flagrantly break them, um, there should be some measure of accountability. I think that's, uh, that's, that was sort of my starting point. I don't know if I would use the word satisfied. Um, as a historian, I think I can separate what I think is good, what I think is bad, what I think is desirable, what I think is unfortunate, and what the historical analysis tells me about the significance of Iran-Contra. Um, so for instance, I can agree with the minority report that the president has vast amounts of power in the foreign policy arena. My personal politics could be that that's not always uh, led to great outcomes but that's not what the historical analysis uh, leads me to believe. Uh, and I, I certainly do hold the view that the president has a vast amount of power in foreign policy. And uh, I also, in terms of thinking about what laws were broken, they investigated for nearly seven years, and they charged people with process crimes for obstruction and lying, which I think did happen. In terms of statutory interpretation of the Arms Export Control Act, they didn't charge anybody. And the, in, the Intelligence Oversight Act, which was the direct language they used for the Bolin Amendments, did not include the NSC. So if, you, if there's some lawyers in the room, and I think there are, I mean, we can argue about the statutory interpretations, but they certainly knew that some of the big laws that were thrown around in the public conversation that were supposedly violated weren't really. And, and quite honestly, there was an Office of Legal Counsel opinion written by Charles Cooper, I think in December 1986, and essentially, Walsh's investigation just confirmed the legal analysis that Cooper had in uh, that memo. Now, I can think that perhaps the laws should have been rewritten if we do have issues with arms being transferred to a country through a third party and Congress not being notified. Congress should do its job, and they should write the specific language into the specific law. But Congress likes to avoid accountability themselves in the way they write legislation, and that was an, at heart in a lot of this. And so I think in many ways uh, you can discern a lot of the comments publicly and privately that Congress kind of understood they had a role in it. And in fact, Daniel in a way says this during the public hearings, that regrettably the way Congress had acted about the Contras, for instance, every year they had a new policy. You know, how do you, 500 and something secretaries of state, how do you have a functioning foreign policy? You turn on lethal aid, you turn off lethal aid. You say the Defense Department, the CIA can't do anything, well then they can. And on and on, every year uh, they were changing the policy. Um, so uh, there was a lot of legitimate questions about foreign policy that came out of this. And I would encourage everyone to go look at the, the latter half of the hearings after July when it's George Schultz. And George Schultz's conversations with Congress during the Iran-Contra hearings are fabulous. And I think they were completely ignored because, all, you know, the, the, the highlights were over. But they have a serious, substantive conversation about the exercise of foreign policy and the relationship between 
the executive branch and Congress, and the areas where they have agreed. And I think if you go and you look at that testimony and talking about bipartisanship and foreign policy in the 1980s, it's established that there was a lot of bipartisanship in a lot of areas. It's just when there were, that's why we're all in this room talking about it. I will, a quick editorial comment. I see uh, Steve Hayward's here, and I uh, commend Steve's treatment of uh, Ron Contra in the second volume of his Age of Reagan book, especially on the congressional dysfunction. It's a really good distillation of... Uh, uh, yeah, just what a mess Congress was, which we've all been talking about in different ways here. Ben Griffin. Uh, Mr. Nicole, I thought it was a really interesting story about uh, North going back to Vietnam to intervene in the war crimes trial against the soldiers. Uh, I was curious if you'd seen anything, uh, have that about uh, anything that he said about uh, Lieutenant Cowley, uh, and, or about how Lieutenant Cowley kind of rose to a similar sort of cause to love thing uh, on the right in the wake of the Vietnam War, including Reagan. Yeah, there's actually a really interesting, I didn't have time to get into it, but um, so Oliver North's first national media appearance is on Firing Line in 1971, and they're there. he's there with two other uh, Marines who had served in Vietnam to talk about war crimes coming out of My Lai and uh, the massacre and how, according to these three Marines, it had, that was the exception. Um, and in their time, they had never seen any war crimes. They had never seen um, anything like that. And there is a way that it starts to shade into um, Callie being sort of like un, um, fairly, being unfairly treated. And you see a little bit of that in Oliver North's recounting around the Herod trial, um, this idea that... Um, that he that that people were focused were trying to make a scapegoat for Vietnam out of the people who were on the ground instead of holding the people higher up accountable. So there is a lot of that really interestingly in that um, so um, Buckley had held a, a firing line about My Lai where he was pretty tough on the war crimes that were being committed there. Um, these three Marines had written in and said we disagree with this kind of. Um, interpretation and then that's why they come on the show to dispute all of this and in that conversation even though it's a year after this uh this incident with herod um north doesn't mention it at all and in fact says that um you know he would never question anyone who would ha he would never question the authority of the military to bring charges against um, somebody who was accused of these crimes um, even though he had just done that uh, a year before so there's some slippage in the way that north presents himself on this issue Yeah, um, following on, actually following on, on Dr. Inbody's talk about uh, Oliver North as an example of a particular kind of behavior, perhaps, like most things, like Joseph uh, <laughs> Douglas MacArthur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's been a long day. Yeah. Um, but the this sort of uh, military leader with a public presence who engages in what we might think of as dubious. Um, I wonder whether there might even be a kind of longer and broader analogy brought here to um, just people in positions of military authority who are who engage in political behavior because they are frustrated with their perceived lack of success in setting military policy. And some of these people, like do engage in behavior that. Uh, they doesn't always quite extend that far, but I mean, you could look as far back in time as the late 19th or the early 20th century, um, the era of preparedness during World War I. Um, military leaders like Leonard Wood, for example, might be. Um, and Wood is not Oliver North. He doesn't necessarily want to break the law in the name of setting a paradigmatic example of the kind of person who sees a. Um, sees a, a Possible constituency out there in the public sector, in, in the public sphere, who could be co opted to a kind of charismatic authority to bring pressure to bear on elected officials to get those elected officials to behave in the way they want these officials to behave. Um, and what's sort of fascinating to me about what the leader of the North is that it's almost as though you're describing this kind of person finally finding a constituency. Mm -hmm. um, because people like Woods don't seem to have who are actually beholden to this. But you're, you've discovered a period of transformation during which a constituency for North, a North-like figure, suddenly manifests. Um, I don't know that I have questions. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yeah. Uh, but that's typical of these conferences. <laughs> Please answer that non-question. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I, um, and since I know that we're short on time, I won't uh, belabor it, but that's uh, really interesting and really helpful um, because I do think he does find a constituency. And the, something that I'm working on, and maybe you don't know some of this, um, one of the things that I've found in the sort of, uh, Liberty University papers about North um, are some of the old files for the um, uh, Council on National, for National Policy. Um, and Oliver North wins an award from them in 1984 for national security. And it's like, that's before Achille Lauro, that's before Grenada, that's before Iran-Contra. Like, why is the CNP spotlighting Oliver North in 1984? I'm very curious about that, because it makes me wonder about his relationship with both uh, p political entrepreneurs, but also uh, that constituency early on. Okay, well, our, our time is up. Um, before I have you uh, give an enthusiastic round of applause for our panelists, I should say, as a, in, in a matter of being fair and balanced, since Congress has taken its lumps in this particular session, <laughs> you all are encouraged to go to the next session where we will we will hear from some former congressional voices uh, defending themselves and the, uh, the first branch of government. So the Congressional Forum uh, starting in the, in the Presidential Leadership Center in a few minutes. Anyway, please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.